Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Feels like such a classroom in here. But it's good to see you. Um, to be honest, I was even more nervous this evening. Due to the fact that I'm going to be talking about the Grunfeld. I don't play the Grunfeld defense. And I don't play um, any sort of d4 transposition with white pieces. So this is new territory for me. I did study the Grunfeld about two years ago. But uh, I can barely remember what happened last week. So good to see you. Good to see you. I'm seeing there's some new emotes in, in Twitch. I see it's all like Christmas related. But good to see you, Cappy. Um, Glamdring, Screws, Pipette, Sarah. What is that? Is that the new Kappa? I don't know if I like it. Why does Kappa look like that? <laughs> but really good to see you. An eccentric horse, I really liked your diss track. And Colvin, good to see you as well. Excuse me, Sarah? What did you call me? <laughs> Tommy G. If you have a golden, you get to go to. <laughs> That's a good one. It works. Of course it works. Giant Pixels, good to see you as well. All right. So like I said, today we will be talking about the Grunfeld. Um, so the reason I felt more comfortable last week is because when you're facing an opening you don't particularly like, you want to know as much as possible about that opening before you, I don't know, before you can have an opinion about it. So that's why I knew quite a little bit about the London system and did even more research and I was taken aback by how much there was out there. I honestly thought there was a, it was a system with a couple moves you had to learn and that's it. But there was more to it. And then we get the Grunfeld. The Grunfeld defense is very dynamic. It, it offers a lot of tactical um, possibilities and that sort of thing. Um, I know also in the Grunfeld, like we'll be going through it, there's one game that will look very familiar. The first one we go through... I'm going to just play the moves. We're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about the opening, but it's something we've done together before. So those of you who have never seen my um, videos, I definitely recommend you go look back on Chess24 at all the lectures I've done before. And we have looked at this game. I think it was um, under some kind of tactical resource that we've been looking at. I know we've done a lot of tactics together. Um, but I'm not going to tell you who played the game and you will have to tell me who played the game. And then the first one to answer, of course, will get a whole round of applause. That's what's going to happen. Sorry, I can't offer much else. A dab? I don't know what <laughs> what is preferred. No mods, no affiliate status. Wouldn't bet on polls. Polls? Oh, yeah, so actually... The Grunfeld is just German for cannon fodder, apparently. <laughs> oh, goodness. Barcelona, Barcelona, Spain. Good to see you. <laughs> How are you mentally recovering after being forced to teach the London? Um, mentally... It's 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 good to it's good for you to assume that I have a mental state. So thanks for that. Hey Z Z Z, good to see you. So now that we've gotten through all the the pleasantries and the salutations, shall we commence with today's business? Business. Like I said, the first game we're gonna go through is just going to be um, a memory exercise for you. To be honest, I would be able to identify the game just by the end tactic, but also throughout the game, um, the. The person playing black pieces should stand out to you. And if you can get the whole game correct, as in if you can tell me who you played against and also how the tactic commences, then, I mean, I will be very impressed. Very impressed. So when I was doing my research on the Grunfeld, this is the game I came across. And um, I was looking at it. I was like, I've seen this. Aha, uh -huh, we've done this before. So it's really cool to be able to do that because I've never I've never studied the classics. Uh, I just gave it away. So it's a classical game. I don't know my chess history. <laughs> oh, Sarah's here to to impress us all. I'm happy. You have to use cup of class instead of oh sorry, cup of claws, right? 
Let's see if it works for me. I'm gonna try it. Does it work for me? Why? Copper. Where's my golden one? Why don't I get a golden copper? Hashtag golden. <laughs> Am I teaching chess from the beginning? Well, this game will start from the beginning. So like I was mentioning with the Grunfeld, um, it's black just allows white to build an attack in the center and uh, then black goes ahead and, and tries to undermine it really quickly. And often you'll see um, the Fien Keto, the bishop on g7 be a key element in the Grunfeld, as well as an eventual d5 that you'll see too. This is an interesting puzzle. We haven't begun yet. Like I said, we were just going through the pleasantries. But thank you for the comment. I have a fever. I think this might be my last stream. What? No, it's not. Don't lie. Okay. So Black as a gets usually gets a development advantage, but let's take a look. Like I said, I'm not going to tell you who is playing this game. You're going to have to tell me. All right, so it starts with knight f3, knight f6. Get better soon. Don't die. Just don't, like, that's the only thing you don't have to do. Don't die. You'll be remembered, Sarah. Sarah's not going anywhere. She's staying right here. Don't worry. Then we have c4. So at the moment, it looks like in English, but then we have g6. And what's really nice about um, chess, just in general, yes, I'm going to talk about chess as a whole, is that when the opening is played, you could basically play any move order, starting with one opening, transposing to another. So you have to have that kind of flexibility where you not knowing an opening in depth, but rather just the ideas of an opening. So for instance, if you're playing the Sicilian, but then your opponent ends up playing the close Sicilian and you end up having some kind of French-like structure, you're going to have to know how to play the French um, strength, French structure. Okay, okay, you don't have to bring the marbles into the chat. Thank you very much, Screws. I missed, I missed her first marbles one. So what? Chess as a whole? With a W in the, in the beginning, Pipette. Yeah. Yeah, you, you really don't have to bring that in here right now, Screws. I'm going to talk to you later. What just happened? What is happening? <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm gonna stop looking at chat for a second and just continue uh, speaking directly to the camera. Um, so like I said, transpositions can occur and if you end up having some kind of French-like structure, you're gonna have to know the general ideas in the French, even though maybe you've never played the French before, but just being able to know the ideas um, in the French are going to put you at ease, maybe just knowing the f6 or c5, okay c5 is already on the board, f6 break, uh, trying to rip open the center and how to deal with the c8 bishop at some point and, and so on. So here we've started with an English looking opening and after bishop g7, d4, castles, bishop f4 and d5, it has now become the Grunfeld. And over here, even though uh, black has kind of allowed white to gain control in the center with their pieces. Um, black gets their king safe quite quickly and also undermines the center with this beautiful move. D5. All right. So like I said, the games are highly tactical and um, in nature can become rather crazy. And we love crazy games. And we know a couple players in the history of chess that are considered not only crazy, but crazy players too. All right. And just another thing to note is that when you feel to the bishop like this, especially when it's sitting just above the king, it becomes one of the most important pieces on the board. And for black, black wants to try and re reserve this bishop. And that's why one of white's uh, main goals in this opening is to remove the bishop with some idea of queen d2 and bishop h6, right? Um, so like I said, a lot of the time white tries to exchange it because black has a pawn on g6. And uh, also another thing with the pawn, this pawn, 
It looks like, you know, Black has some kind of fortress going on. It protects the king, but also this pawn can become a problem. And the reason is, it's one kind of rank closer to white, which allows white the opportunity to create um, some open file for the rook. And this pawn is called a hook. White will hook their pawn, getting it to h5, hook the pawn to g6, creating the open file, and then being able to attack down the h file, or just on the king side in general. So usually after a move like h4, you'll often see counters like h5 just trying to close down that idea. But we'll see what happens in the game. Okay, let's catch up in chat. <laughs> Thanks, giant pixels. <laughs> Screws putting a W right at the beginning. <laughs> Sorry. Oh my goodness, you trolls. Sorry. Wow. <laughs> I'm fine with transposing to other openings as long as it's not the same. I agree with you. We don't we don't say the L word in the chat, unfortunately. I feel like this cannot be good for black. They are ah. But remember, and I don't think a lot of you know this. Um, when you are developing in chess, a pawn move is not considered a developing move. Moving your minor pieces, moving your major pieces, and castling are considered developing moves. So if you end up moving about five pawns, so if you're playing cannon fodder, which was some kind of random opening created by um, my chat, uh, okay, uh, it's just pushing up every single pawn one square and then developing and doing what you want. But developing a pawn is not developing a piece and would not um, follow one of the opening principles, which is develop your minor pieces or develop your pieces and get the king safe, right? So every time you move a pawn, you're actually wasting time. You're wasting a tempo. And along with moving pawns, I mean, it can it can go both ways. Moving a pawn can gain space and in turn bring some kind of advantage. But it can also be a weakness because every time you push a pawn, you create a weakness. You leave some space behind. A pawn is the only piece or the pawn is the only um, little guy on the board that cannot move backwards. So you really have to keep in mind and be certain about moving your pawns before you do. At least um, with the other pieces, you're able to reposition them. So if you happen to move a piece to a square that doesn't look so great, um, you can always change your mind and say, okay, I need to reposition it to this square. But once you've moved the pawn to d4, once you move the pawn to c4, you can't say, okay, I don't want it there anymore. Let's bring it back. It doesn't work that way. You have to give to get. <laughs> Is this Karpov versus Kasparov? No. Unfortunately, not. But good to see you for those of you who have just joined us. This pawn is called a rook. What, Sarah? I thought you were paying attention. I think she's focusing too much on her um, marbles wins. And zombie. It can go both ways. I wasn't talking, okay, my goodness. When you try to give a serious lesson, but the trolls do not want to wait for tomorrow. Okay. Oh gosh. Was it King of the Hill? What happened next? Intriguing. I really hope you're serious about that. What's up, Torlek? Okay, D5. Queen b3. And queen b3, I believe, e immediately equalizes in this position. It puts pressure on d5. And I'm pretty sure he's going to aim towards bringing the rook to d1. And after exchanging on c4, the queen would just take, and white would continue ha to have a beautiful center. Right? So he takes, queen takes, and c6. And c6 is pretty self-explanatory here. It both defends the pawn on c7, um, okay, because the pawn's not on c7 anymore and is now protected by b7, but also somewhat prevents the move d5 gaining more space. This central pawn move would be really good for white if what white was be able was was able to to actually make it. So making a move 
like knight c6 for instance, wouldn't be really great because of d5. Well, not immediately probably. Let's see. d5, maybe there's knight f5. Okay, anyway. So c6 and e4, already <laughs> trying to dominate the center completely, knight d7. I know it feels a little, a little uncomfortable here with the black pieces, since white has two pawns in the center already, the knight is coming to d7, but also note that white's king is not safe yet. So if white wants to start attacking, now would not be a good time to do so, because, of course, the king would be in the center and in danger. And the only place that is kind of logical for white to start attacking is in the center. And if white wants to open up some files, it would be very dangerous for the king. Knight b6. I like knight b6 because it both attacks the queen and also allows the path for the bishop. So the bishop's going to come out either, I believe, d7, e6, g4. These are the only safe squares. Okay, bishop g4. And bishop g5. Moving the piece twice when that king is not safe at all. Not safe at all. But now things get a little crazy. A little crazy. I need to look at the chat. Um, it's it's not Smyslov. It's not Smyslov. But let's take a look. See if you guys are, are, are guessing. It's not Budvinik. Uh, Budvinik is not playing here. Smyslov is not playing here, but I think I've given away enough already. The trolls are starving right now. Mm -hmm. In one hour, I mean, just wait for the morning. Just, just wait, because if the if the chat's dry tomorrow, I, I'm gonna have a serious chat with you guys. We'll be all <laughs> set with pencil and paper ready to learn tomorrow. <laughs> Not teaching tomorrow. Not you, at least. So transpositions are positions that go both. <laughs> mm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Was it played by a person who is still alive today? Um, like I mentioned before, I think the only thing I was really able to give away is that it's considered a classical game, but it's a very well-known game as well. Uh, Sarah is pulling a Sherlock Holmes on me right now. Cochrane Banerjee. Where did you get that from? No. <laughs> Okay, so we have bishop g5. So bishop e2, followed by castling, would have been more prudent, as the comments suggest. The bishop move played allows a sudden crescendo of tactical points to be uncovered. And I almost said by who, but I shan't. I can't shut, so, so I shan't. Oh, that, that didn't work out in English. Okay, so the next move... Uh, so instead, of course, of bishop g5 here, it was suggested that you just play bishop e2 and castle. But after bishop g5, something happened. And I think once you get this move... Um, okay, someone in YouTube chat got it already. Great stuff. <laughs> yeah, nice Calvin. I, I believe Calvin was here. Nice screws. So what was the move? What was the move? I'll wait for you guys. I'll give you some time. But I think what we did last time also pr worked pretty well. So we wait for 10 people to give the answer. And then we play it. So it's almost like you got a... It's not e5. The Grunfeld defense is 
named after GM Defense and has nothing to do with the current belt. Wow, okay. Night A4, ZZZ. Good job, good job. It was Night A4. Night A4 deserves an exclamation point. Definitely does. All right, so what happens... Now my question changes. What happens if white plays knight takes knight? What happens? Knight A4. Good job. (laughs) System versus defense. (laughs) No. (laughs) That would be terrible. I agree with you screws but you can't just keep things like a uh, general i want to know what happens so also we need to know that sometimes or most of the time in the grunfeld the c file opens up don't want to spoil it for the others right got it o- opens up and black often seeks uh, to make the most of controlling that file just like in the sicilian right Nineteen fifty six is that the year? Okay, so like we were saying here, knight takes knight would just be followed by an unfortunate circumstance of knight takes e four, um, <clears throat> and and after this, just attacking the bishop, attacking the queen. I don't believe there are a lot of moves that white can make. Queen a5 is also on the table since this is check attacking the king and the knight and the bishop. So there's a lot of tactical things going on. And to be honest, the first time I saw this game, I was like, okay, Grunfeld. Hmm. And then when I got given the topic, I was like, maybe this is a sign from the universe. I need to start playing the Grunfeld. So, so far, the universe has given us the London system, has given us some tactics, has given us some basic endgames, and has given us the Grunfeld. So probably incorporating all of this in our uh, repertoire um, will go down very well including the fact that I'm going to have some opening training straight after this <laughs> alrighty so we have um, not knight takes a4 but instead white has decided to play queen a3 okay so like we said on knight takes a4 knight takes e- a4 and white faces considerable difficulties right then knight takes e3 Knight takes e3. So I'm going to read the quote that uh, was given over here. So at first glance, one might think that this move only helps white create a stronger pawn center. However, Fisher's plan is quite the opposite. By eliminating the knights on c3, it becomes possible to sacrifice the exchange via knight takes e4 and smash white center, while the king remains trapped in the center. So like we mentioned before, with bishop g5, that was a bit of an early attempt at attacking. And what what needs to do differently is get the king safe first. So even if you have the center, guys, don't get too excited, overwhelmed. Even the top players um, get a little impatient with these kind of things. And never see castling as a waste of a move or a waste of a tempo. Because the king... Um, <laughs> the king is the most important part of the board. And you have to protect the king. It only rarely becomes an active member of society in the end game, when there are fewer pieces to attack the king, and the king then becomes an active attacking piece, where you direct it towards the center. But this is no king of the hill uh, variant, so you cannot uh, just get it out there immediately. <clears throat> We are ca- what? Why are they rating in chess, please? Why is there ratings in chess? I suppose some kind of motivation and also ranking method. So every time you win a game, you gain rating. Every time you lose a game, it goes down. Yes. So it is actually game of the century. Game of the century. The immortal game. Of the 20th century. So taking on... I don't know why it keeps doing this. There we go. Bishop e7. And there we have queen b6. Bishop c4. It gets very spicy here. Knight takes c3. And bishop 
c5, bishop c5. We have a small little check. The king moves over. And now, the move that rattled the world, the move that caused earthquakes, the move that ended Pangaea, the world, <laughs> right, one of the most famous moves in history now, it's not queen takes c5, <laughs> yeah, The Grunfeld defense of the German community. What's this? I will look at that clip later, Poco. What are you guys putting in Discord? The suspense. Drum roll. I'm waiting for you guys, of course. I need at least 10 of you to get the answer. ZZZ is onto something. So I got one. I'm counting. One. <clears throat> Rook is free. The, the queen is also free. The queen is also free. It's not that easy, Chandon. Might be one. No, no, no. No, no, no. It's it's a bit of a oops. It's a bit of a wow move. Yeah, but it doesn't help. It doesn't look as like enthusiastic. We put a, like a question mark behind it. I mean, in front of, behind in front of it. <laughs> Resign. Sure, that is the move of the century. That is why out of a hundred years they've chosen this game to represent it. Flip. <laughs> Bishop e6. That's what I want to hear. So far we have two of those. It's not queen takes e5. Two of those. Yeah, so the queen's being attacked. That's what we need to note here. But also the king has kind of hampered the activeness of the rook. And this rook is going. So we have some compensation. Times eight, three. <laughs> oh man, I have to get that kappa. I'll overuse it tomorrow. Right, four, five. We have five. We have a high five. Big hand, six. Hey, I'm this. <laughs> I had a burrito on stream in honor of you. Six bishops? <laughs> no. Get <laughs> them. Yes, seven. Screw said it already, I think. Eight. Okay, we're gonna count it all in. Plan D type, plan two. Oh, yeah, my needs almost no water. That's why he's still alive, which is great. Okay, so it's bishop e6, and the crowd goes wild. Hype. If this is the game of the century, then move 17, bishop e6, must be the counter of the century. Fisher offers his queen in exchange for a fierce attack with his minor pieces. Declining this offer is not so easy. So if bishop takes bishop e6, that would be, it leads to Philidor's mate. Of course we know what Philidor's mate looks like. Oops, I didn't scroll, you scrolled. Why are you like this? There we go. Philidor's mate. With bishop takes e6, let's use some arrows instead. Queen b5, king g1, knight, king, knight, king. And then we have uh, queen, queen goes to f1, rook takes a knight back. e2, mate, beautiful stuff. 
But that's not what happened. Instead, he accepted the queen. Then we have bishop takes c4, king g1. And now I feel like it pretty much plays itself. Over here, you would think just to take the rook. But Bobby Fischer wasn't greedy. Right, so we have Donald Byrne versus Bobby Fischer. I think you said 1959, which made... It, he was 10? I don't know how old he was that year. Okay, knight e2, king f1, knight takes d4. And now we have something called the windmill. A tactical scenario where a king is repeatedly revealed to checks is sometimes called a windmill. King g1. Also, have you guys watched Queen's Gambit? I've been obsessed with it. Um, I haven't finished it. I had some work to do, but I, I watched like two episodes today. It's absolutely amazing. Um, I don't want to spoil anything, though, so I'm not going to tell you where I'm at. Um, they were in Mexico. That's all I know. Okay, so knight c3, king g1, and just capturing the bishop on b6. So taking what you can at this point in time. And over here we have to also note the queen cannot simply take on c3 because the bishop, oops, the bishop is defending on c3. So we have queen b4 attacking the bishop on c4, rook a4, queen takes b6, and knight takes rook. Yum, yum, yum. h3. Rook takes a2. Knight h2. Is that her name? Anna Taylor Joy, that's cool. <laughs> 1956. Okay, there we go. Fisher was 13. Donald, what? In. Whoa, okay. I don't take much notice of things. Yeah, it's a series, but I think it only has seven episodes because the last episode is called Endgame. So I don't know if it's just a one season show. I don't really know what happens at the end. So it's probably like Pride and Prejudice, the original Pride and Prejudice, where it had like a few um, episodes. But I know Queen's Gambit is also a book, right? It comes from, it's written... Uh, it, it was a book, a screen, screenplay or something. I don't know. <laughs> Anya. Ah. A seven episode series. Yeah. Cool. Wasn't the original Pride and Prejudice a book? Yeah. So it was a book and then they stretched it into a couple episodes. Um... A one series, uh, one season show, and then I think I think Queen's Gambit was also a book. Which book is good chess? Oh, I've read a chess novel before, the Death Heads Chess Club. I received that as a gift from Brett actually. It was a couple years ago. He got himself a copy. He got me a copy, and we were reading it, and I really enjoyed it. Okay, the beginning was a little slow, and then when it picked up, I couldn't put the book down so that was amazing you think the book was a a spin-off from the tv series <laughs> Alrighty, king h2 enough of that knight takes f2 and rook e1 rook takes queen d8 bishop f8 knight takes rook now my question is how does black continue here so now you have to look into your hearts, guys. This is nothing tactical. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But I want to know from you, how would you continue in a position like this? If there's no immediate way to checkmate someone, how do you improve your position? Obviously, we have to look at the least active pieces. We have to look at um, where we want our pieces to be, and so on. Golden, golden. Hey, Kartik. Rebecca created the first. <laughs> and sign up for looking into my heart. 
What did you sign up for, Mariah? Harry Styles' newest release today, music video, Golden. I think you have a, a very unhealthy obsession with Harry Styles, Sarah. We gotta look into that. Reassess your chest by Silman. My favorite chess book. Hmm. Probably Winning with the French by Wolfgang Ullmann. That's a book I, I checked out of the library one too many times. Um, someone who owned the book lent it to me first and then they moved away and I had to give the book back. And then I was looking at a few of the libraries in my city and only one of them had it. And it wasn't too close. It wasn't the closest library to home. So every time I wanted to check it out, I had to go there and check it out. And I wanna be things. I wanna be a star. <laughs> I wanna be in movies <laughs> when I grow up. And we're singing on an educational stream. This is great. Who's she talking to? I'm talking to you, Syed. To you. I see you. Here, bishop d5 traps the knight. I like bishop d5. That's exactly the move that was played. Every piece in pawn of black's camp is defended. White. White's queen has nothing to do. So we'll get to that point now. Knight f3. And now the knight comes back to e4. Just that extra central pressure. We really want to make sure that the queen has nothing to do, right? So b5, and suddenly we've reached that point in the position. h4, since the white queen has nothing to do, she hollers over to the other side of the board. Hey guys, I'm out of moves. I got nothing to do. It's your turn. And then the pawn's like, I'll move for you. And then he moves to h4 h5 like we spoke about this much earlier okay it's endgame now but much earlier if white wanted to cry try and attack on the king side if white wanted to cry he could also do this um he could play h4 h5 and just uh, grab onto this hook on g6 and try to rip open the king side but h5 is a good counter and knight e5 king g7 just releasing the bishop and this is a nice threat here as well. Bishop to d6. King g1. Bishop c5. And now the fun begins. King f1. And I need the correct order of moves. Please, let's go. <laughs> it's someone with a demon accent. No. <laughs> Did they accuse Bobby of using stockfish? Stockfisher? That's funny. That's very funny. Am I streaming somewhere else? Yes, I'm streaming on Twitch, CoChess. Twitch.tv forward slash CoChess. And here on Chess24 YouTube. Yep. Amisha, hi. Yeah, we did this game already, but we should be going a lot quicker. Yeah, so we're just going to run through the end. Knight g3, king e1, bishop b4, king d1, bishop b3, king c1, knight e2, king b1. So literally just going on a king hunt. This is amazing. See a check, play a check. Knight c3, king back, and the mate on c2. I believe there's two ways to checkmate and there's bishop a3 also rook c2. <laughs> the YouTube chat actually wants to learn. Zombie chainsaw, you have influenced this chat negatively. This chat doesn't want to learn. <laughs> yeah. Now you guys are doing a great job. Okay, so now that we have one down, we're going on to the next one. This one is between Sergei Karyakin 
His rating is 2700 at the moment. I also posted something quite funny on Twitter earlier. At least I find it funny and if I laugh at my own jokes then well, that's just sad. Then we have Sergei Karyakin playing against Peter Svidler. And uh, this game is from... I have the date somewhere. Or the year, I think it's 2008. Let me check. 2010. Then I have Karpov Svidler 2008. <laughs> in the time of the game <laughs> oh wow you guys have to save some trolliness for tomorrow come on be nice has a world champ why are you so convinced that you're Magnus Carlsen bro okay so they're both 2700 and the reason I brought up Twitter is because uh, Peter's Twitter account, uh, Paul Borza, I think it's called, I don't know what it's called. Um, his bio says probably still over 2700. Like that's probably unchanged as well. He has this kind of, I mean, he's, he's a wise and witty guy as well with the commentary that he does a lot of the time on Chess24. I mean, I thoroughly enjoy that and... Um, that's what I usually watched. I mean, at least growing up as well, 2013, 2014, there was the World Championship and he did the commentary. And I mean, I didn't have Wi-Fi back then. So I lived um, incredibly close to my old school and I used to walk there. I'd go sit in the field, set up like a whole picnic blanket and have some snacks with me, hook my Wi-Fi up to the school's Wi-Fi and just chill and watch. And I saw the commentary with like Sopico and uh, Peter Svidler and I was so intrigued and I think that's when I really uh, fell in love with the chess to the point where I wanted to work um, hard on my chess. So that was really cool. Growing up, yeah, I was like 2013, I was 16 years old. So story time. <laughs> yeah, I was 16. Youngsters. Of course you can follow me on Twitter. My handle is Jesse, J-E-S-S-E underscore Feb. My name is right here as well. <laughs> oh my gosh, some self-promo. I don't think I'm allowed to do that. <laughs> oh, you've looked in the mirror? Then I probably believe you, right? Svidler. Svidler. I thought it was Svidler, like... Okay. I want to learn, but I'm treating this as a podcast. So you're just listening? You're not actually watching? Are you a 97 child? I am. Are you a 97? Are you a 96 child? D4, knight f6, c4, g6. So we have something straight out of a, a Grunfeld picture storybook. I wonder if those will exist at some point. Don't steal my idea, guys. I'm going to create chess books for kids and I'm going to name each and every piece and it's going to be a, a picture storybook and each piece is going to talk as well. There's going to be dialogue and then it'll be a bedtime story and the kid will be sitting in bed and he'll be like, Dad, what's that piece? It's a bishop, son. And then it'll just go on that way. <laughs> Vivid memories of 97. Oof. Spring chicken. <laughs> what a chess book sometimes in tail. <laughs> Harry the horse. <laughs> well, I mean, don't laugh at me, but I already <laughs> illustrated my first chess book. <laughs> It looks great, okay. It's all pencil drawings. <laughs> okay. D5. Final Fantasy 5. I didn't know the internet existed back then. Jokes. Can we see the illustration? No! <laughs> I'm shy. Okay, D5. We have a Grunfeld once again. Maybe I'll show you. Um, okay. So C takes D5 and Knight takes. And the cool thing about this particular opening 
is that the knight is sitting on c3. And the reason why that is so important is that if the knight was on f3 instead of c3, there would be no way that white, uh, black would be able to capture a knight and instead would have to retreat to b6. But here he's given the glorious, glorious opportunity of capturing the knight on c3. And I quite like this because after taking, you want to open up this uh, diagonal for the bishop. So this amazing dynamic moves, uh, bishop, okay, bishop g7 first and then c5 um, puts so much pressure on this diagonal. It looks beautiful. I would love to play black in this position. <laughs> yeah. There's a nine month old Jesse down in some. What? What? <laughs> okay, anyway, moving moving forward. Let's let's finish this uh, this game today. Okay, it's not tomorrow, today. <laughs> so we have bishop e3, bishop g4, and rook c1. Queen to a5, queen d2. Okay, you can see the immense pressure on the queen side, especially with the bishop. The king is about to um, be uh, safeguarded. Of course, it's going to be locked up in a in a safe room with uh, uh, steel walls. Then we have knight c6 and d5. So he opens up the diagonal a little bit, but probably tries to counter in the center because of all the pressure on the flank with the queen on a2, c3, and here just tries to chase away the knight. Although I would believe that in this position, the black king is a lot stronger or a lot uh, a lot safer than white's king because it's only one move from being castled and white would still have to develop the bishop. Unless white, of course, finds a move that uh, wins a tempo by developing, but I don't see anything that he can attack. Capturing on f3 is brave. But now we have some strange moves ahead, I believe. Yes, rook to d8, rook to d8. And after bishop d3, an even stranger move. You would not be able to guess it. Because here the knight is hanging on c6, right? But decides to castle. He castled. In this position. Like what happens after capturing? Okay, probably there's c4 and no cause of concern. But after castling, the queen comes back to c7. And... The, just the tactics are crazy here. Queen comes back because the king side is now unsafe. Queen e2 and knight e5. Bishop b5. Bishop b5. So we must swap bishops for pawns. I don't think we're on the same page right now. When I first went to Union, September 97. Whoa. <laughs> okay. Oh, screws. I'm sorry. I'm also a shorty. I'm not from Norway. I'm from South Africa. I was <laughs> I was born in January. The end of January. I was born on the 28th of January. So write that date down in your book. Yeah, 23 years young, guys. Bishop b5 and g5. g5 is strange. g5 is so strange. Because now my question is, what happens after bishop takes g5? Bishop takes g5. Chance. Bishop takes g5. What happens? What happens in this position? Eccentric horse, I feel like you're having some identity problems. Some issues with identity. Not even born in February. Yeah, so I... Okay, that's a bit personal, never mind. <laughs> the answer is long cause. Amadeus, you got away with it before. Unfortunately, you cannot get away with it again, since both kings have already castled... So tread lightly. Yeah. If I play king h8, rook g8. I know, that's the first thing that came to my mind as well. 
that's the first thing that came to my mind and apparently not the move let's see i mean it's completely equal here i guess it's just uh the idea right anyway f4 was played knight g6 and taking on g5 I wish I was a 2700 so I can understand this as well. F6, taking on F6, but I guess you're right. You want to try and open some files, because if you don't open files, you won't be able to attack with your rooks. Your rooks would just be stagnant, stationary, for the entire game. So we have king h1, queen to e5, and f3, attempting to safeguard the king, but also just protecting the pawn chain over here. Rook to f8, brilliant. Now we're putting pressure on the weakest pawn on the pawn chain. When you see something that intimidates you, just attack the base. Go after what scares you. And that applies in life lessons, guys. Hashtag life lessons. When something, is a f when, when something scares you, when you're afraid of something, face it head on. That's all you got to do. <laughs> Open a file, double click. It's icon. What? Oh no. <laughs> Area fifty one. <laughs> You're gonna have nothing left for tomorrow, and I'm gonna be the one laughing at you, okay? When my humor levels are one thousand, yours will be zero. Bishop d7 is quite odd. Probably just trying to redirect the bishop to the king's side for safety reasons. And chopping. See a pawn, take a pawn. Don't listen to me, don't do that. Some pawns are poisonous and you are not Snow White, so be careful. Queen takes e4. That's the second pawn down. King h8 and bishop to d4. It's crazy because it puts itself directly in the arms of black's pawn on c5. <laughs> no, I don't think so, Puppet. You already know the Grunfeld? What? Am I playing with a computer? I mean, these are 2700s. I'm not playing any games right now. <laughs> I'm analyzing. Or um, we're going through the opening at least, or at least the powers of the Grunfeld. It's about play the Grunfeld. And if you want to get better at it, look at the videos, Peter Fiddler's videos on Chess24. The ones, I actually watched those two years ago. They were amazing. I think it's a set of like 10 videos or something. Um, but the... The database of videos on Chess24 is crazy. And then you get Chessable as well. And those are even crazier. Okay. Rook takes f3. And then exchanging on g7. King g1. King g1. This position in particular reminds me of a game that just happened. Rebecca was playing a game. Um, you should go check it out on Lee Chess. It's really, really good. Okay. King f6. Bishop g4 h3 knight g6 king g2 and the rook swings over this is perfect play look at this oh my gosh wow wow oh my word let's go go peter that's amazing so peter took the dub versus sergey karyakin on that very day beautiful stuff guys don't you think it's beautiful so the Grunfeld, like we discussed, is a very tactical opening and offers a lot of tactical resources. And that's something that I believe there's a lot of theory in. So if you do want to invest your time um, learning the Grunfeld, it will definitely pay off. If you consider yourself an attacking player, you want to steer clear of openings that are going to um, kind of suppress your talents. If your talents include... Uh, tactical abilities then then you got to nurture that by playing openings that suit your style obviously and there was actually something i heard someone say um when you have a gift in in tactics if you had to choose between having a gift in tactics or positional play 
you would much rather have a, um, choose a gift of tactics because that would just come naturally to you. It includes a lot of intuitive um, ideas that you kind of incorporate in your play because everyone wants to be tell, right? And it's easy to acquire the skill of positional play rather than having um, a talent in positional play and having to acquire the skill of tactics or tactical vision because that is um, going to be a lot harder. So if you find that you're good at tactics, try to nurture that because when you're playing tournaments, you can't rely on your talents and gifts alone. You have to obviously work. So the best um, the best you is obviously going to come from incorporating both uh, hard work and your God-given gifts. So use that and uh, stay in school. Don't do drugs. <laughs> If you had to choose between a gift and tactics and a million dollars, which would you choose? You see, your gift and tactics can bring you joy by solving tactics. But if you have the financial security of a million dollar screws, that would be a different that that would be a different story. Because if you're sitting at home doing tactics, but geographically speaking, you're in a place where there is no potential of growing your chess abilities with actually implementing those tactics and gaining ELO, then there's no way you will have to travel and that costs money. So I would choose a million dollars because you can invest that and then travel and become the best player ever. Zimbabwean dollars, I changed my mind. <laughs> I changed my mind. <laughs> A million dollars. Yeah, so there was a a student uh, in my fifth grade, fourth grade, I think it was fourth grade class that had just moved. No, 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 it was sixth grade. She had just, it doesn't really matter, I guess. <laughs> she had just moved from Zimbabwe and she joined our class and for show and tell, she brought like her wallet and she had all of these expired notes because they had updated the notes so often that if you if you didn't um, either deposit the money that you had these notes would expire and uh, I don't think you're able to use them so she had these like million dollar like zim dollar notes and I believe now that it's one of the main, re main reasons why uh, Zimbabwe uses uh, US dollars now because when I visited Zimbabwe in 2018 no, 16. Then I was uh, using US dollars there. No, Cappy, I'm not. Buy a lot of Tic Tacs. You could buy Tic Tacs with uh, a million dollars, but you can't buy tac. I guess you could improve your tactics with a lot of dollars. <laughs> that pep talk took a left turn. I don't know. If the pep talk worked, then I counted as a win. I counted as a win. Yes, Memento. I was going to say I was due in February. <laughs> that was a good guess. Oh, wow. Yeah, so if you guys need some laugh advice, you know who to call. And it's not the Ghostbusters. <laughs> no, Glendrick. Don't twist the story. How much would a million Zimbabwe Zimbabwean dollars be worth? I don't really know. I don't want to do the math. Yes, I said math. 2300 euro, according to Google. Who are you going to ask? Ghostbusters. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. All right, guys. Today was a very successful day, I believe. The Grunfeld is great if you're a tactical player and you want to walk in the footsteps of players such as Peter Fiddler. Bobby Fischer and the likes. So I definitely recommend. And I think that if you're studying the classics and you spot any openings that either interest you, or openings that you already play, and you ever doubt yourself playing that opening because of maybe the results that you're getting, um, I wouldn't say stop playing the opening and changing it completely. Or maybe if it doesn't suit your style of play. But other than that, I think that it's just a matter of practice and uh, memorizing theory is really important 
and just checking out the games of the top players because it's both going to motivate you and um, influence your ideas over the board. So keep on keeping on and I'll see you guys next week. Bye.